thought i'd let it play out that time because i i usually cut it off so i thought i'd let it play out one complete time for you guys so now you've heard the whole song so <laughs> i don't have lines randall i make it up as i go you think any of this is planned <laughs> how well do you know me <laughs> it's all off the cuff brother i wish i had a plan but usually i just uh turn on the lights and open my mouth and <laughs> we're just we're off to the races <laughs> So anyway, all right, guys, uh, welcome to the Paranormal Portal, Bedtime Stories from Beyond. Uh, I hope you guys are having a wonderful night. Uh, it's Thursday. Wow. It's Thursday. Tomorrow's Friday. And remember, Barb Charlton will be joining me here on the portal tomorrow night. Um, she is a, a certified therapist of, uh, it's a modality that's really helps with healing and dealing with trauma and stuff. And she is uh, really interested in helping people that have de dealt with um, some traumatic paranormal events and stuff and so it's going to be a lot of fun to have her on and uh to hear her story and stuff so she's going to be on the first hour uh, uh tomorrow night and uh, i'm looking forward to that it'd be really neat to meet her and uh i haven't even had a chance to talk to her in person yet so it'll be a lot of fun um but tune in tomorrow night 7 p.m pacific time as usual that's the start time for all the portals but anyway uh, i hope you're all ready because well it's time for bed <laughs> <laughs> well, 
thanks, D. I appreciate that. That's really cool. Uh, Julia, did you get a cold? Is that what I'm understanding? Uh, I hope not. I hope she didn't get it, but I know what that's like. I'm just on the tail, tail end of it now. It wasn't a horrible cold as far as colds go. I mean, it was uh, pretty much, you know, just about, you know, I guess five days of congestion and some first day of sneezing, terrible sneezing. But I always like sneezes, so <laughs> they don't really bother me. But um, it never really totally hit my lungs too much. It just kind of hit my my voice mostly. So I, I ended up doing pretty good this time around. <clears throat> but I hope you feel better, Julia, if that's the case. I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, it's allergies, she says. Okay, well, maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Mm-hmm. But I didn't give it to you, I promise. I don't think you can catch it through the internets or the interwebs. I don't think you can catch colds that way. So maybe it is just allergies, and I hope your allergies clear up quickly. But we are off and running here, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. Um, I am just looking forward to being here with you. And now I am, so I'm in my happy place, and I hope you're in a happy place too. I hope you're all comfortable and uh, got something to drink and lower the lights, uh, even though the daylight is still shining out here. It's like, whoa. Uh, it's been, we got some much needed rain up here, so it was really cool. It had been getting really dry, and there's forest fires starting already all over the place. And it's like, God, really? You usually got to wait till like July for that around here. But we got a head start this year, but I hope this rain's helped to, uh, to take care of that and, and get those under control in a hurry. Um, but let's get her started. The first story I got for you guys tonight is coming from Ohio, of course. Like, <laughs> I mean, geez, should do the Ohio portal pretty quick. I'm going to have to start an off branch of the show, the paranormal Ohio paranormal portal. Um, my God, everything's out of, out of Ohio. So let's see what's going on in Ohio today. Uh, right off the bat. So this is a nice short story. So it said, this happened recently, so it's really, really fresh in my head. And I recently moved to another house with an upstairs, and it's really beautiful. And for a full two weeks, I hadn't noticed anything odd about the house until about the third week when I would hear low whispering sounds at night. It was so low that I wasn't able to identify what was being said. But it still creeped me out. I had put it aside because I know all houses have their, you know, individual little noises. So I tried to put the uh, idea of a ghost behind me. Another week had gone by where all I would hear is just weird noises of things that I really couldn't explain. Um, but one night I even heard someone say my name. I ran downstairs to see what my mom wanted only to find out that she never called my name. So I started to feel like I was going crazy, but... My parents assured me this was all in my head and that I, I had only imagined these things. Uh, so I knew they were wrong, but I pretended to agree with them. That's probably a good idea. Next thing you know, you'll be in therapy. Uh, the, that night, I was pretty tired and decided to go to bed early, and I'd gotten under the covers, so I closed my eyes. Uh, but for some reason, I felt like something was watching me. I heard a weird noise there. Um, I felt like something was watching me. Uh, so I opened my eyes and I looked around and through the window, I saw a face staring right at me. It was an old face that seemed really angry and hateful. And I looked at it and it, it moved swiftly away from the window. The next morning I didn't even bother telling my parents because I knew they wouldn't believe me anyway, but I didn't care because I know what I saw and nobody could tell me different. That's the whole story. So we don't know what happened after that, ladies and gentlemen, but I'm sure it was lots of fun-filled adventures with the angry face in the window. That's, a, <laughs> that's really terrible. I don't know why some spirits are so crabby, and, and I, you know, I, maybe they have every right to be. I don't know. I, I really don't understand, but uh, I guess if there were crabby people in life, there'll be crabby people in spirit life. Um, the only change is that you don't have a body, as Jeffrey Seelman says. And I, I think he's right. I think that that's true, that whatever personality quirks a person has in their lifetime, they're going to have in their after lifetime too. Um, but I think that if they transition and they go on, then maybe that kind of irons out all those world kinks and you kind of <laughs> you kind of get a, a, you know, a fresh press on the old soul and uh, maybe you're not as jaded. But, uh, you know, I think some people, when they don't transition, they just hang on to all that all that world stuff, and it doesn't, you know, remains the same. 
So I think there's something in the transitioning. So anyway, let's get to the next one here. My computer's being absolutely doggy. I'm going to have to restart it. All right, so the next one is coming from Utah, otherwise known as Utah. And uh, let's see what's going on there. This one's pretty short, too. It says, <clears throat> I used to work at a, at a rest home, and it was called The Courtyard at Jamestown, which I've written a story about already, and most people, most of the people I took care of have passed away by now. So when I go for walks in the Provo Cemetery, which is really quite often, as it's a really nice place for a walk, I sometimes find someone I used to care for. One day, my son and I were out on a walk, and at the time he was about one and still in a stroller. And <clears throat> When we reached the cemetery, I let him out of his stroller to stretch his legs. It's a great place. Just go play along the tombstones, youngin'. Um, and usually he sticks close to me, but we just sort of wander around on the road and but on this occasion, he wandered over to some of the, re uh, the headstones and just stopped and stood in front of one of them. I urged him to come with me so I could start getting some exercise, uh, but he wouldn't move. He was only one at the time uh, and a bit stubborn, so I really didn't think anything of, of his not wanting to come to me. And I couldn't see the name on the headstone until I got right up to it because it was one of the flat ones. But when I saw the name... I was very surprised. The grave belonged to one of the sweetest men in the whole world. His name was Willis Moon, and he was one of the funniest residents to take care of. He was a sheep herder and always had a lot of corny jokes to share with all the nursing assistants. Uh, if you knew, if he knew you, you weren't and you weren't opposed. He had a lot of dirty jokes that weren't that bad for an old guy. And once I reached the headstone, my son waited around for a minute while I said hello to Willis, and then he went on with our walk, and I guess I'll never know what made him stop in front of that particular grave. Did he see Willis, or was this all just a really weird coincidence? Just sort of makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, but then again, a one-year-old kid, I'm sure, sees pretty much everything that's going around, and maybe Willis saw you were taking a walk there and wanted to meet your son. Uh, I think that's... Maybe a sweet story. Maybe it's spooky. I don't know. Not quite sure what to make of that one, but I think it's sweet. I'm going to go with sweet because <laughs> it's dealing with a little kid. I don't want to think of it being spooky. Okay, this one's coming out of Colorado, and uh, this was before the mushrooms uh, were legalized. <laughs> so I don't think anybody was tripping down there at this time. Well, I'm sure pl plenty of people were, but not legally. <laughs> So this one is, it's actually a medium-sized story, so hopefully it's good. My story happened just about four years ago, and I'd moved, I'd moved to New York to start a new life. I'm glad you filed your story under Colorado. That makes perfect sense. I'd moved to New York to start a new life with my then-girlfriend, Lisa. We wanted to save up some money, so we were just staying with my mom in the Bronx in an apartment she had just recently moved into herself. And the building was probably close to 100 years old. It was a one-bedroom apartment, so my girlfriend and I slept on an air mattress in the living room while my mom slept in the bedroom. Everything was absolutely normal for the first few months, and then strange and weird things started to happen. My first experience happened to me one night after Lisa and I, Lisa and I had gone to bed, and I've always had a problem with going straight to sleep, so... I was just laying there with my eyes closed when I heard what sounded like someone breathing. At first, I really didn't pay any attention to it because I thought that it was maybe just Lisa. And uh, so then I heard it again and again, and I asked Lisa why she was breathing so hard, but I didn't get any response. She was asleep. I decided to investigate the strange noise, but I didn't find anything, and I went into my mom's room to see if maybe... She was awake, but she was sound asleep as well. I was pretty baffled, and I just decided to go lay back down for about an hour. Uh, after about an hour, so I was about to sleep. I was about to go to sleep, rather, sorry. The following morning when I woke up, I didn't mention anything about the noise to either my mom or Lisa, and a few days had gone by without hearing that noise at night, and then it happened again. 
Only this, si- this time it seemed to be louder than the first time that I heard it. I sat trying to figure out what could possibly be making this noise. After about 20 or 30 minutes, it stopped. The next morning, I decided to say something about what I'd been hearing, and I told my mom and Lisa about it, and they both just laughed at me. I asked my mom if she ever heard anything like that before I had come there, and she said no, that she hadn't. The next night, I was in my mom's room playing my video game when her and Lisa were asleep on my mom's bed. I really wasn't trying to hear that noise again, so... I was going to stay in my mom's room until I could fall asleep. Um, But out of nowhere, my stereo, which is in the living room, turned on. I was startled by this and didn't want to turn it off, but it was a bit loud, so I had to go do it. And when I got to the stereo, I thought to myself, if maybe the alarm was on, but I checked and it it wasn't. I I remembered to note the time, and it was 1.30 a.m., the same time that I would hear the breathing. I slept in my mom's room that night, and the next night at bedtime, Lisa and I were back in the living room. Fearing that I would hear that noise again, I pulled the sheet over my head, and I was laying on my left side, and Lisa's back was against mine, and all I could do was wait for the breathing to start. And shortly after I pulled the sheet over my head, it did. Only this time, it started to move around the room. It had never done this before. I really began to get scared at this point, and I just wanted for it to stop, but it didn't. It started getting louder and closer to me, and then it happened. As I laid on my side, I felt someone's hand lightly stroke my arm. I was instantly paralyzed by fear. I actually felt fingers stroking my arm through the thin sheet. After that, everything stopped. The next morning, I couldn't wait to tell my mom and Lisa what had happened to me in the night, but when I did, I received the same response as I did the last time I told them. They both laughed. Upset, I decided to go take a shower, and when I took my shirt off, I noticed that my arm, where it had been touched, was slightly discolored. I showed this to both my mom and Lisa, and they couldn't understand it. They both thought that it was a bit weird, but still... They didn't believe me about my experience with what I believe to be a ghost. It never happened again after that while I stayed in that apartment, but I will never forget about these experiences, and I am thankful that I've had the opportunity to share them here. Wow, that's that's pretty intense. I don't know what the discoloration would mean. That's strange. Um, It kind of kind of makes it creepy, actually. Um, What did it do? What was that all about? I don't know. Very weird. But apparently it wasn't saying so. Aw, Deb's here. Hi, Deb. And hello to everybody, by the way. I'm sorry. I hadn't really uh, said uh, hello to everybody. But hello, everybody. I hope you guys are having a great night. And uh, thank you all for being here. Um, (laughs) D D was listening to World Bigfoot Radio. (laughs) Let's not hug the Wookiee, she said. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you don't hug the Wookiee. Just ask Duke. He'll let you know. All right, so the next one is actually from South Dakota. That's kind of refreshing. We don't see a lot coming out of South Dakota, but I think, again, it probably has a lot to do with population density. There must be a ton of people in Ohio, huh? Or just Ohio is just that creepy, and that's all there is to it. <clears throat> all right, let's see what's going on in South Dakota. Um, says my mom and my mom's mom, nanny and her mom all have the ability to feel energy of spirits. It is amazing to hear the stories about what they have been through and experienced. And I don't think that it, that I, it is inherited to be able to feel the spirits, but I do think that families that do not discredit what they are feeling will have children that will not be discouraged to welcome the feeling. This is a story of my first time that I remember a spiritual encounter. When I was in third grade, my mom, dad, brother, and myself moved to Plankinton, South Dakota. I'm now 22 years old and can just start to tell people about this experience again. We moved into an old township schoolhouse 
before we could move in it, it needed to be cleaned. And on one of our trips over to the house to clean it, my dad and I were touring the country around our house and came upon an old abandoned house. Even as a third grader, I remember thinking how beautiful the house must have been back when people lived in it. The next time that my mom came to clean and I was with, I took her by the house that we had discovered and she looked at it and a sense of fright but also peace came over her face. The next time we went back to Plankinton, my mom's boss, Brenda, and her husband, Dan, came with us to help with the cleaning. When we finished, we took Brenda and Dan by the house, and when she saw it, she said that she wanted to go inside. We did not figure it could be any harm to, to go into the house, so she went in. And this was, this was the first time any of us had gone into the home. When she came out onto the balcony, I remember thinking this was odd when she said, this house will be mine. We didn't know what she was really talking about at the time, and on our way home to Mitchell, she told us about when she was about halfway up the stairs, she heard footsteps coming up behind her. She thought it was her husband, so she called out, Dan, but he wasn't there. Then for some reason, she said, Ella? And this is when my mom revealed that when she first saw the house, she felt children playing Ring Around the rosy in the front yard. And soon we found the owner of the land and the house, and Brenda asked if she could take the lumber from the house to her store. And the, the owner said that this would be fine because he'd been planning on burning down the house to make room for a farmland. And soon after that, we started to go to the house more frequently. One time we took my Aunt Jan and my Uncle Dan there, and uh, when my aunt came upstairs, she found me talking to someone. And there wasn't anyone in the room. <clears throat> when I saw her, I took her to the, another room and I explained that there was a mother in the room holding a baby and they looked so sad. One thing about the house was that every time a male tried to enter the house, something would happen to them. Brenda's husband, Dan, tried to enter the first time and he was cut by a nail in the doorway. He was cut so deep that it was a borderline if he needed stitches or not. My dad tried to enter, and he was struck by anger and left the house because of this feeling. When the construction people came to start taking lumber from the house, they soon came back to Mitchell and told Brenda that they couldn't do it. We had never told them anything about what we had experienced with the house, but they said they just felt really unwelcome there. One day, while we were out there, we took some pictures of the house, and when the newspaper heard of this story, they wanted to run a story on the house and our experience. When the writer asked if they could go out and take some pictures, Brenda said, yeah, that should be fine. And when my mom went to pick up the pictures we had already taken, she got burned on her fingertips. And then she told Brenda, Ella does not want him here. They ended up using one of the pictures that we had already taken. After the article was published, a man came to visit the store and had a story to tell us. He was a grandson of the owners of the house, and he told us that his great aunt was born there and her name was Ella. We had not told the writer about my experience or my encounter of the mom holding the baby, so this was not published. When the man was telling us more about the house, he told us that also in the house, a mother giving giving birth to a baby, and the baby had died soon after the birth. And he was in complete disbelief that we knew so much about the house without ever talking to anybody that was alive or without doing any research about the house. In addition, he told us about why men probably were not welcomed into the home. He told us that the women and the children lived in the house that, that we had been in, and men lived in separate house and this was so that the men were not disturbed by the children. The houses were lived in by more than one family, and he thinks there were about three families that lived in these two houses. This was so they could farm more land and have more food. Soon after we took Brenda to the house, she had been consumed with jealousy about everything. My mom had worked for Brenda for eight years, and it was a strong relationship before this, as they were the only two running the antique consignment shop. Brenda was always a wonderful boss until this time. One day my mom picked uh, me up from school, and this was different because 
I usually ride the bus, and I soon found out that Brenda fired my mom after they got into a huge fight. Since then, my parents said that Ella was a bad spirit, and they did not want me talking to about her anymore. It was hard at first because the house was only two miles from our house, and if it were not for the, the shelter belt of trees, we would be able to see it from our house. Since then, I have experienced other energy in places, and I try to welcome them because sometimes they are trying to tell me something. Some of them are an uneasy feeling, and the ones in our house sometimes were uneasy feeling, and I have also met spirits that are just here to comfort us. When a classmate died on our graduation day, I felt a sweet spirit there at the school during pictures and during the ceremony, and this was just a few instances of when you feel them around. It is difficult to tell people about what I've experienced because most people in South Dakota are very traditional in what they think, and they do not think that this could really happen. I know, however, what I felt and have, and to have that man come into the store to confirm what we had felt. So, yeah, that's a great story, and I guess it's this person's coming of age, I suppose, into their abilities. Sorry, i got to get a drink. I'm really bone dry. I don't know. That was a, it was a decent story. All right, and uh, let's see what's next here. Ooh, this one sounds good. Ooh, this one sounds good, too. Okay, I'm pulling up four more. We'll see how far we get. I don't know how long they are, but this one's pretty short, I think. Here we go. This one's from Indiana, so that's right next to Ohio, but it's not Ohio. I was at home alone one afternoon with my infant child, and my son was about 10 months old at the time, and he had fallen asleep in his bouncer downstairs in the living room as he usually does. And I was upstairs dusting and sweeping the bedrooms, and I always keep the doors double locked when I'm at home alone, even during the day. We live in a small town, but we live on the main drag of town and occasionally have run runs of break-ins in our county. A friend of mine had called while I was cleaning, so I was talking to her as I worked upstairs. I heard some noises coming from the kitchen, and I was immediately concerned and alerted my friend who I was talking with. She told me to quietly walk down there while I had her on the phone and check things out. I was freaked out because my baby was down there alone, and I went downstairs, and nobody was there. All the doors were still locked, and my baby was still sound asleep. The noises sounded like dishes clanging in my trash can, which is a heavy metal step can, opening and closing, and I thought it was crazy, and went back upstairs and continued cleaning. Once again, I heard the mysterious noises, and once again I went down and checked on the baby, who was still sound asleep. No one was around and no sign of anything being disturbed, so I went back upstairs. I wasn't up there long when I heard my baby screaming at the top of his lungs. I ran down the stairs as fast as I could, and in the living room where he was, he was standing up straight in his bouncer, stiffened up, and turned towards the door behind him, just freaking out. That's when I noticed the door to be unlocked and wide open. I was still on the phone with my friend and could barely even tell her what had just happened. I was totally freaked out. That's just one of the many experiences I've had in my home. I plan to share a lot more at a later time. My home is at least 100 years old, and we live in a very historic town with lots of old homes. That means lots of old energy. Those old homes, they all got some old ghosts, I think. And it, and it doesn't necessarily mean a, a presence in and of itself, but they do have a presence. I mean, these old homes just have a feeling that <laughs> it's unmistakable when you walk in. It's like, oh, you know, for, for, mo for many people anyway. I, I assume everybody has those feelings, but I guess that's not a safe assumption to make. But I always love walking into antique stores and stuff because of that, I don't know, just that energy. It's like everything has a story or something. All right, my nose is kind of plugging again. Sorry. <clears throat> I'm trying to work it out. I am trying. All right, hold on. <laughs> 
Let's go to Don Cam. There is no Don Cam. I mean, he's here, but and I'm going to mute me. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> and I'm back. Okay, sorry about that. Just, uh, you know, there's some things I don't, <laughs> I don't want on camera, and one of them is me blowing my nose. It's just not a good sound. Okay, so this one's coming out of New York. Let's see. Look, I see Bigfoot. I'm just looking at the chat, and I see, look, I see Bigfoot. I don't know what's going on, but Julia sees Bigfoot. When I was eating dinner with my whole family in the dining room, one of the lights on the chandelier would flicker. My grandma said, oh, that's Merritt. And I was like, huh? And this was Gram Grandpa Irvin's chandelier, and after he died, it would flicker when your dad said it was him, him saying hi. Now that your father has passed away, I think it's him. I was so happy my dad is in my house. Then my dad got annoying. His spirit moved into the chandelier, moved to the chandelier in the kitchen, and whenever I do my homework, one light flickers. One time I was fighting with my mom and the light flickered and I said, stop it, and it stopped. And my mom looked at me like I was crazy, and then it flickered again. My sister turned off the light and turned the light bulb, and then it stopped. Then a minute later, it started up again. It actually got on my nerves after a while. My dad also came into my math classroom, and my teacher was writing on the blackboard, and then the overhead moved right next to me. And then the overhead moved right next to me. Oh, one of those overhead projectors, yeah. And she turned around and saw it was moved, and she pulled down the white slide sheet, and then she walked away, and it went right back up. I laughed. I think my dad did it because I was bored, and he wanted to make me laugh. I know this is all my dad's doing because it's always something that relates back to him. Oh, well, I don't really want to get rid of him. I like it. I just wanted to show you uh, a story of my dad and I. And that's cool. I mean, I hope it is that person's dad checking up on him. I, I think that's a wonderful thing. When our loved ones stay close and present, I think that's great. I got to look at the time. Yeah, we're just 33 minutes into it. That's cool. It's moving along nicely, ladies and gentlemen, tonight. It feels like a good night, doesn't it? I hope you guys are having a good night. I, I feel, I feel kind of peaceful tonight, and that's good. <laughs> I think it's just being on the other side of this cold helped a bunch. So Indiana is the next one. Oh, this one's kind of lengthy. Not overly long, but a little long. I'd like to start off by saying that I I. Do not know if this is a ghost story, angel account, or a hallucination brought on by the grips of the late stages of lung cancer. To me, it has been a comfort as well as a confusing instance. And to make it even more interesting, this happened on the very first real day in our new home where we now reside. My father-in-law was taken to the emergency room here in Elkhart last November with flu-like symptoms that simply would not go away. Being in his 70s, we thought he just needed a stronger medication than we were able to get over the counter, and he has a strong dislike for doctors. Medical treatment should be given by a medicine man, and he was very angry uh, with us as doctors just want money. They do not care about your health physically or spiritually, so we had a time getting him there to begin with. After a battery of tests, it was found that he had an advanced stage of lung cancer and his doctor refused to release him on the grounds that he felt dad may not make it very much longer. On that vote of confidence, we brought him back home and he had been living with us since uh, our daughter was in kindergarten and this is his home. Wherever that dwelling might be, this is where he belonged. Dad outlasted all the doctor's estimated timelines and slowly his health declined and we were able to get his medicine man to come out to the house and treat him only a couple of times last year. With the help of hospice, we were able to give him the care that was needed. But he then required 24-hour required care and the economy being what it is, we couldn't afford to pay for an in-home nurse 
and a live-in facility was out of the question, so I became his primary caregiver. In essence, he became my child, and I changed him, fed him when we could find something he was able to keep down, and encouraged him, complained with him, and loved him just as I do my daughter and son. I carried him whenever he could not walk any longer and told him no one else really mattered when none of his other 15 children would come out and visit. I never left the house unless someone else was present, which caused strain on the family as there were plays, college, entrance seminars, etc. that I was unable to attend, but this is where I was meant to be at this point in my life. God kept me here for a reason. We had one load of belongings to bring over here on the third of this month, so we decided to call it quits for the night and sleep in our new home. We had to move. We were relying on my husband's paycheck, and that was just not quite enough. At 2.30 in the morning, my four-year-old came running into my husband's in my room, announcing that Papa told him there was someone in the house, and he was to come get me or my husband. My son chose me. Without question, I got up and searched our entire home and came up with nothing, so I just started opening boxes and unpacking while watching Dad, and he said, Someone was about six foot tall, walked through here with confidence and said nothing, and when he walked past Dad, Dad felt comfort, not fear. We, we left on a light on wherever Dad slept as he had developed a fear of the dark, and if I had to quickly get to him, there would be no obstacles, and I could not be, it could not be a case of Dad not being seen. We, we brought the last load in and said goodbye to the old homestead to begin new life here in the morning of the 4th. And Dad asked me if I liked my new home and I felt, and if I felt safe here. And I assured him that I really did and thought he would also. But Dad got worse. By four in the morning, he was speaking a language I don't know while looking intently into my eyes. He pointed to my son, so I walked out of the room and sent him in. My four-year-old and Dad were conversing, and I had no clue what was going on, and we called in the hospice nurse at 7, but by 7.30, Dad was gone. I apologize. This is still very fresh, so emotions overcome me as I write this. The nurse has no explanation as to what went on between my son and my father-in-law. She has never seen or heard this before. The medicine man feels my child was preparing another child for entry into the new family, into a new family, and the pastor thinks Dad was speaking in tongues. What about the being that Dad saw in our home? Did he see my husband walking through earlier in misplaced time when telling my son to come get us? Surely he would have recognized him, and all the time I knew Dad, he was a firm believer in the Spirit going directly to heaven or purgatory and not walking the earth for any stretch of time. What were my son and Papa discussing? What were they speaking? My son, bless him, says he will tell me when I'm ready. Wow. That's great. I mean, that's cool. If the, if the child understood it, that's really powerful. It's also really powerful that the child is going to be de- determining when the mom is ready to hear it. Huh. That's really cool. All right. <laughs> Let's see where the next one's coming from. Indiana again. We rolled a double on Indiana tonight, ladies and gentlemen. As all you know, I've been telling you about a few things that have happened to me in the past and some recently. I guess I didn't know that, but uh, (laughs) that's what I get for randomly opening stories. Uh, I have to say that the majority of time, I'm not scared except for the time that I had someone watch me while I slept. Usually I try to find a more sane approach, thinking that maybe it was this or maybe it was that, but I guess the majority of us would do that. But this time, everything that I thought might be turned out not to be so, so I have no idea what it was. On Friday, I was home with a migraine, which I suffer from, and I had not had one for a while, but on Thursday night, it started. And it was so bad that on Friday, I called into work and said that I was not coming in. 
I did have to get up close to lunch time to drop off drop off my daughter's lunch at school since my sweet husband was too lazy to pack for her. <laughs> That's nice. She calls out her hubby even in the story. <laughs> Must be love. It was about 10 a.m. when the noise woke me up and I opened my eyes and kind of focused to where it was. And for all, all, all of you that have had at least one migraine in their life know why I say this. For those of you who don't, you really can't think or focus on anything. It's just like you're numb. So I'm trying to listen and wake up at the same time, and when I hear it again, it was like a bang and a dragging, but it was as if they were doing it against a wall. At first I thought it was my dog in the kitchen playing with something, and then I heard it again, and it sounded as if it was coming from upstairs in my daughter's bedroom. I was really awake and ready to get out of bed to go see what what it was, uh, and it stopped. I then blew it off and took a shower, and I didn't hear anything or feel anything that I normally do. And on Sunday, I was helping my daughter clean her room and pick up, and I didn't see anything on the floor that would have made the noise. I even checked a few things that, and rolled them on the wall to try to figure out the noise, but still nothing. I often wonder if they know that something is in the house or that can hear and see things that they do that they do who's they i don't know what they're talking about here kind of like the movie the others uh warning movie spoiler where they did not know they were dead and other people were now living in their house these are things i often wonder i have more stories to tell i just had that one happen recently so i i decided to tell you this one well we appreciate it thank you so much sorry about your headaches though I used to have terrible migraines myself. Cluster migraines, as it were. We got time for a couple more. Let's do a couple more, huh? Let's do maybe three more. I'll pull up three more. I don't know how long these are, so we may not read all three of them. This one's very short. This is from Massachusetts. Um, I've mentioned before in my stories how my ex-mother-in-law's house was a little... Um, creepy. So I figured I'd tell you where it all started. My ex-mother-in-law was cleaning out the attic of her new house before she officially moved in, and there were some strange things left behind by the former owner who was more or less forced out of his home by his children and moved into a nursing home to be cared for. It really was a large house with a half-finished basement, three full bedrooms, and a somewhat finished attic that was split into three rooms, a storage area and two bedrooms, and she was tidying up the place and found an old milk crate filled with some religious books. She had no idea what religion, but she was very Catholic and didn't want them in her home. Upon further investigation, she said it looked like they were some black magic type of books, so she put them in the pile that would be tossed out later, when her husband got home to help. While up in the attic, she uncovered a box with a beautiful porcelain doll inside of it. (laughs) Oh, no. She picked it up and noticed it was in great condition despite its obvious age and thought she would hang on to it, possibly to have it appraised and see if it was worth anything. It was clearly an antique and had an incredible detail. She set the doll on top of some other boxes to keep it from getting damaged in her cleaning attempts and As soon as she put the doll down and turned to finish working, she heard a large inhale followed by a slow, steady exhale coming from the direction of where the doll sat. She said the hair on the back of her her neck stood up and she had goosebumps all over. She turned around praying to see her husband or one of her kids behind her, but unfortunately she was all alone in the house. (laughs) <laughs> she she shoved the doll back in the box, threw it on the floor, and left the house and waited until her husband got home and promptly sent him into the new house to get rid of every last thing in the attic. She talked it, chalked it up to her being tired and overworked, but looking back, she she realized that was just the beginning of years and years of unexplainable stories. I'll share more of those another time. 
Yeah, well, as soon as I heard doll, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> it's obviously been in a box for a reason, and that's why it's in such good condition. <laughs> that, there, that there doll's got some stories, I'm afraid. All right, we're going back to Ohio, ladies and gentlemen. How long is this one? Ooh, this is, this is medium length, I guess. I've been telling this story for years, and it's kind of achieved a legendary status in our family because it is supported by no less than five people. This isn't necessarily a ghost story, but exhibits some sort of connection between family members. What? <laughs> Paranormal Portal Bikini Contest. I don't think you want to see me in a bikini. <laughs> Unless that's not what you're talking about. <clears throat> All right. This story involves my late grandmother on my mother's side, Margaret. She was an amazing woman who excelled in art and enjoyed life. She was very gregarious, articulate, loving, and open-minded. She believed in a world in which things are not always what they seem. Though I personally put a premium on science, she kept my mind similarly open to the possibility that the world is bigger and more diverse than most people think. This tale takes place in the early 60s in central Ohio. My family has lived in the region for over 150 years, and my grandmother and grandfather lived in Columbus but had a little summer cottage south of town, a little uh, vacation community called Hideaway Hills near Chillicothe or Chillicothe, uh, C-H-I-L-L-I-C-O-T-H-E. The house they, they maintained there had electricity but no phone, and this wasn't unusual in rural communities at the time. <clears throat> One night my grandparents were there alone and they had gone to bed at a normal time, but my grandmother was tossing and turning most of the night. In her sleep, she kept imploring my grandfather, Richard, answer the phone. We have to get the phone. It's ringing. Answer the phone. My grandfather, Richard, knowing there was no phone in the house uh, down there, kept telling her so and trying to get her to stop thrashing around. She told the story as, as he having said, go to sleep, you, <laughs> go to sleep, you old bat. There's no phone here. <laughs> He's a, he is a practical and often stoic man, but he loved his wife beyond words, and in spite of the old bat reference. Uh, still, she slept fitfully and murmured throughout the night about the telephone. In the morning, she told my grandfather about the strange dream she had that night. She related to him that she had dreamt of a dark room in which a pink coffin was standing upright, and in the coffin was her mother. Around the coffin were her four siblings chanting, We tried to call you. We tried to call you. We tried to call you. He confirmed that she had been wailing about answering a phone, but of course, there was no phone down in Hideaway, so he was confused and assumed she was having a nightmare. They soon packed up and drove the short hour back north to their home in Columbus, and upon arrival, they opened the front door, and the phone in the kitchen was ringing. My grandmother went to answer it, and on the other end was her sister, Mar Mag Margie, uh, her sister, and she says, Margie, mother died last night. We tried to call you all night, but nobody would pick up. I'm so sorry. We tried to call you. My grandmother's blood did not chill because based on, based upon the strange occurrences she had throughout her life, she half expected something like this, and she was pretty tense the whole ride home. As the family began to deal with the passing of their matriarch, it became clear that as word had spread that night, many of her siblings had tried to contact my grandmother to let her know. What is this beautiful, strange, and mystical connection between family members? Family is my religion. Hmm. That's powerful. I think that's cool. For sure. Again, in dream states, I think we're way more open to that kind of stuff uh, than in our normal waking state. So if you're sensitive while you're awake, chances are you have pretty profound dreams. <clears throat> or can. Uh, again, the last one's Ohio <laughs> again. Wow. This story takes place in the autumn of 1995 in Columbus, Ohio. My grandmother's sister-in-law, Aunt Margie, also my grandmother's name, coincidentally, had been very sick for some time. 
She was suffering from a brain tumor that was killing her. I had known she was sick for months, and my mom would often ask me to visit her in the nursing home to which she had been committed the previous year. I watched her condition condition worsen for months, and she went from struggling with her memory to improperly employing simple diction. That Lazarus, which is a department store, she'd exclaim as we drove past, they have um, hamburgers there. Very good. And, of course, I knew this was incorrect and evidence of her declining health. Eventually, she was totally bedridden and was often totally incomprehensible, sometimes babbling and eyes rolling about the room, and it was clear she was near her death. A pretty dark night, huh? <laughs> Yikes. My parents were divorced, or are divorced, and they lived near each other and had joint custody over my sister and I, so we rotated between houses together, living with each parent for about two weeks at a time. And One Friday night, I was sleeping at my father's house on the north side of town. In the morning, we, were trans- we transferred down to my mom's house, and upon walking into the front door that morning, I related to my mom a short, vivid dream I had experienced the night before. In the dream, I was sitting on the driver's side of a bench seat in an old orange Buick. Aunt Margie was sitting next to me on the passenger side, and my right hand was resting on the middle portion of the bench between us. Her hand was clasped in mine, but it was wet, clammy, and cold, and I turned to look at her, and she turned her head to look at me, and she smiled faintly. And that was the end of the dream. And I awoke rattled because though I'm an active dreamer, this one was particularly stark and unsettling because of its simplicity and the almost tactile aspect of her cold, wet hand on mine. It gave me the impression of having touched cold jelly. And I can sense it to this day. So after telling my mom about this dream, she said to me, Oh, David, that is too weird because Aunt Margie died last night. This in and of itself wasn't surprising as she had been sick for a long time and we all knew her time was limited. I chalked the dream up to conscious knowledge of the situation and this was just a way that my subconscious was dealing with it. It was coincidence, I thought, that this dream came to me that Friday night. That is, until Sunday... On Sunday, the elders of the family convened to read her last will and testament. In it, she divided up her belongings to various members of the family, and to me, she left her car. My grandparents knew that that she did indeed own a car, but had not driven it in years because she had become portly and was unable to drive herself around easily. For Thanksgiving, for example, I often drove up to her place to pick her up and deliver her to wherever we were having dinner that day. Most people had not seen her drive in years, and I, if I ever had, had not seen the car since I was very, very, very young. <laughs> Thanks, smoking, smoking sweaties. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're obsessed. Thank you, brother. My mother came home and told me that Aunt Margie had left me her car and her will. Both my mother and I knew that this was pretty uncanny based on the dream, but still didn't think too much of it until we entered her garage that afternoon. As the garage door lifted, I froze in my tracks as there, almost in mothballs, was an old dusty orange Buick from the late 70s or early 80s, and I instantly recognized it as the one from my dream. I said to Mom, that's the exact car from my dream Friday night. Mom said, I was afraid you'd say that. Do you want to drive it home or should I? I was reticent to do so because nothing like this had ever happened to me before. Finally, I saw no harm in it and tried the engine, and I put the key in the ignition and turned it, and somehow the car still worked. There was a little gas in it, and I drove it home, mulling over the circumstances in my head, and when I pulled up in front of our house, I sat in the car and thought about Aunt Margie, and she wasn't even technically a blood relative of mine because she married my grandmother's brother. For some reason, before I got out, I put my left hand down under the driver's seat, and there I extracted a handful of Aunt Margie's hair that must have fallen out due to the chemotherapy she was undergoing. 
This chilled me and excited as I chilled me and exited the vehicle with haste. <laughs> we had trouble starting the car after that, and eventually I sold it. And I related the story to my grandmother, who was known for possessing a sixth sense of sorts, and she was convinced that I too had a similar gift. And after that, my grandmother and I agreed that when she passed, she'd have to stop by and let me know in my dreams. My grandmother, with whom I was very close, as we were both artists and always had a distinct connection, died unexpectedly about nine years later. Unfortunately, I did not see her in my sleep when she passed, though I dream about her often to this day. I sometimes wake up crying, but always hope to dream about her, and I miss her terribly and hope I can hold her again in my dreams. Wow, that's a cool story. Um, not a lot of spooky stories tonight, huh? Just all had to do with people seeing people. <laughs> Booty shorts with a flap in the back. What? <laughs> I don't even know what I've been missing in the chat, but uh, uh, clearly I'm going to have to reread <laughs> re -read all this. Uh, it might be more fun reading chat than it is uh, reading ghost stories. <laughs> I don't know what's going on in there. Oh, Elaine says, saw my mom get in an auto accident while I waited for her to pick me up. Even told her the type and color of the car. Saw my dad get stabbed even though he was in Korea and I was in Washington State. Wow. That's really powerful, Elaine. Very, very powerful. Very cool. Hello, Stacy. Good to see you. Michigan Rob. Um, all you guys here, um, all of you who are here, I'm sure my cousin Paul and Melissa are listening too, but... Wherever you are, watch your top knot. That's all I got to say. But let me look at the participants. We got Bigfoot Michigan Rob Duke is here. D Swigers here. D H is here. Elaine Clifford. Jessica Mink. Lewis is here. M Cat. Orange County Girl. I'm here. Randall Electric is here. Smoking Sweaties is here. <laughs> I love that name, Smoking Sweaties. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds hilarious. And Stacy Lynn is here. So. Um, I'm sure there's more here, but that's the YouTube list that I get. And so if you're here and I didn't say your name, I am sorry, but uh, I can't see any other names. MCAT, did I say that? MCAT's here. Um, but no, maybe that's all that's talking. I don't see a lot of other names coming up here. So uh, I guess that's about it, though, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've enjoyed this journey. Fangirl. <laughs> what? Um, but, <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just trying to understand. The, oh, Gemini's here. Good to see you, Gemini. Chris Guy is here too. Good to see you guys. Uh, love you guys too. Love you, Stacy. Uh, Orange County Girl, I did say you. Um, just making sure. Orange County Girl, you're a fan. Good. Yeah, send your stories. If you got stories, ladies and gentlemen, send them into the paranormal portal, radio at gmail.com. Or next time we're on, you can call in. But again, tomorrow night, remember, we've got, uh, we've got a guest coming on who is uh, really uh, interested and has helped people dealing with paranormal traumas. And uh, so we've got everything, everything covered, and she's already extended herself to be a resource if anybody's dealing with some horrible haunting or has dealt with something horrible and scary in the paranormal. She is more than happy to uh, help you through that emotionally and you know, with, with her special brand of therapy. And so I, I, I'm really excited to have this conversation tomorrow. And I know it'll be fun. It'll be a good one. Uh, it's, it's a new one to me, too. I've never heard of this before. But her name is Barb Charlton. And she'll be on tomorrow nights for at least the first hour. We'll see how it goes. Um, if she's got a lot more to cover, we can go two hours, too. But uh, it'll be a great introduction to her. And I'm really looking forward to that. She's got some information she wants to send over as well. So we have some visuals. But I hope you guys will tune in for that and join us tomorrow night. Um, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I see. I, I'm getting messages on, uh, on Facebook as well. A gentleman named Tom is asking about the night vision binoculars that I use, and i got to look them up. I, I don't remember the brand. I mean, they're sitting over on the, on the desk just over there, but uh, I, I don't remember the brand. It wasn't a, a well-known brand. I know that, but they're, they're good. They work good. So anyway, guys, that's going to wrap it up tonight. I love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice, take care of each other, help each other out, 
find the magic in every day and remember to laugh as much as you can. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Uh, I will be back tomorrow night, same time, uh, for the two-hour show. And I hope you guys will be here then as well. But take care, everybody. Sweet dreams. And I'll see you soon.